after three days of good work from everybody. And I uh, really want to thank everybody here. You've seen many experts. Uh, among those experts, I'm not one of them. I'm not the Minister of Gender. I'm not the expert in gender. I just came here to say thank you. I've been told that everybody here has been excited for the last three days, uh, discussing with all the stakeholders. And I think you have to really give credit to the International Monetary Fund. I don't know how they thought of organizing uh, a conference like this one here, with really people to come and share experience, learn from each other, and realize together what needs to be done. Not IMF telling them what to do, but bring them together, exchange ideas, discuss, learn from each other, and then we go home and do our homework. What is the next step in terms of moving forward? We thank IMF for really bringing the high-level people, the UN women, of course, my colleagues, minister from Liberia, and many others. I heard there was a minister from Ghana. I don't know if she's around. Uh, my job then here becomes much easier because I don't have to give much of the speech. And I'm sure from your own experience, there is really no much debate anymore because this is not a gender issue. It's no longer a human rights issue. It is a fundamental development issue that we really we are talking about here. You cannot ignore half or more than half of the population, women, and claim that we ever sustain the development that we want. So that's why it is very, very important. And here, that's why we have to discuss the policies that have to close the gender gap in all areas, in education, in health, in labor, in uh, financial sector, in all the sectors that we think that are very critical. And in the case of Rwanda, it is even serious because women are 52% of the population. So what we did here was very, very important for us to be able to look forward was to start with the constitution itself. Making sure that in the constitution, there is one line, there is one article which says that, that at least 30% of decision makers have to be women. And this uh, statement was very serious because it's in the constitution. And once it's in the constitution, then it guides other laws and the policies that we put in place. One most important thing was after this was to put the structure in place, the institutional arrangement, meaning you must have a ministry. And this ministry is not only the Ministry of Gender, but also family promotion, meaning that you are looking at it holistically. Number two, you needed the gender monitoring office to make sure that you can monitor through the whole entire system to see how gender issues are being taken. And then you have the National Women Council. That one organizes countrywide to make sure that the gender issues are also taken into account. And you have the women, the Forum for Women Parliamentarians. This is very, very important because they are the ones who make laws and it becomes very critical in terms of decision uh, making as well. But also what we thought was very important was this is not the government just policy. It has to be nationally owned. The stakeholders really play a very key role. The local government, the civil society, the media, the international organizations, the private sector and others have to be partners in this journey. If they are not, I don't think we can achieve much. We can have good policies but nobody is there to implement or you don't have stakeholders to help in terms of implementing them. And having, uh, of course, put this uh, in the constitution, that's when we started looking at the numbers. The parliament had to take the lead, 64%. The cabinet, 50%. The judiciary, 50%. We saw the numbers going up. In the local government, in some areas, like the vice mayors, they're up to 80%. So we saw the numbers going up. And it's not only numbers, but also is what they do when they are there in these kind of positions. Even in the government, strategically, when you have the labor issues, then the Minister of Labor, the previous ones have been women. The Office of the President, the Office of the Prime Minister, everywhere women, in addition, of course, the Minister of Gender. So this becomes very, very important. There are issues that have been barriers for us for a long time. Women never used to inherit anything. It was only men. Just by changing that law becomes very useful. 
They never had ownership of land, access to land. But when this law was changed, in 2013, 2014, when we were doing the household survey, then we say we want to know what has happened. How has this law impacted on the population, allowing the women to access land? Surprisingly, we realized that actually the joint ownership of land was 54%. But for women only, it was 26%. And for men only, it was 18%. And we say this is working. Because now women can use land as a collateral, and we have to supplement it with, uh, of course, a policy decision that in our business development uh, services, we had to allow 75% of the collateral to be paid by our financial institution. Meaning women who are disadvantaged previously, this time they can access a loan much easier because they have land. They also have 75% guarantee that is provided by the government. But at the same time, it helped in terms of exclusion. From the statistics, we realize that the women who are financially excluded, at least by in 2012, they were 32%. And by 2016, it had reduced to 13% because of the policies that we have been taking in the financial sector to make sure that women are included. And now, because of the mobile payments, because of other things, we are also seeing them, really those that own ICT assets, going to 40.8%, which is really very, very much encouraging as we move forward. But at the same time, when we realized there were so many issues that also were a barrier to women, and we introduced the law on gender-based violence. That's when you saw so many institutions working together. That's when you started the Sanje. Uh, I'm sure health centers, if you have visited them, one-stop center. And then we brought the police, the uh, local government, the Minister of Gender, all the stakeholders coming together and making sure that we deal with this issue. And we put the Sanje one-stop center all over the country now to make sure that these issues are very serious. And this is really reducing the number of the gender-based violence that we have had in the country in the past, sometimes they are not even talked about. It's no longer taboo. It is something that we must uh, address. In terms of labor, we are lucky that when the labor law was reviewed, at least there's no discrimination. The pay is the same. It doesn't matter who is the boss, but there's no discrimination of any kind. And this has helped really uh, in making sure that you have the women in the labor force currently uh, if you see the household survey, that recent one, 2017, it is showing that the women in the labor force are 46%. But there is potential, which also the statistics expose. 63% are those potential labor force for women for the ages between 16 and 30. And for the ages between, uh, at least above that, we are seeing the numbers also going up to 57 0.7% and so forth for women. So we are seeing that the, at least the laws that have been put in place, the legal frameworks are uh, yielding results. And that's why you had to supplement it with maternal leave benefit scheme that you have also put in place to make sure that giving birth is not a barrier to continuing the work because government is also footing the bill together with the private sector. And I think for the government to lead by example, it also had to make it low, mandatory, to make sure that there is the budget itself leads with the gender responsive budgeting. This is really, has been very, very important and it was a very strong learning experience for all of us, especially I would say in the Ministry of Finance and Economic Planning. Initially we thought the gender was for women and we thought the Ministry of Gender was doing a very good job. There's no need for us to come in. But when the law came out, we are forced to do that. So we had to work with the Minister of Gender and others say, what are we supposed to do now that the law is, is out? And we are so scared because at the end of the day, uh, we are the one to answer on behalf of the country when we take it to, to cabinet. And the president who is leading the whole gender uh, responsive budgeting, who leads in the whole gender promotion, we know that there will be so many questions being asked in the cabinet. So we have to be very careful and have statements that make sense, have the budget that is gender inclusive. But also what, is, uh, what we feared most was in parliament. Parliament, they are very, very, uh, I would say, vocal when it comes to gender responsive budgeting. 
And then we imagine when the parliament is led by a woman, the deputy, woman, the deputy speaker is a woman, and the head of the budget committee is a woman, the head of the economic committee is a woman, the head of the social committee is a woman, and it is a parliament of 64%. And then you say, how do I present this if I don't get it right? <laughs> so for us, we had to learn the hard way. After doing it for some few years, then we got used to it. And I can say that now it's now routine. It's now known. We are now monitoring uh, all the projects in terms of implementation and giving a report to cabinet every three months to make sure that we can also show the progress. So this has been a very wonderful uh, learning experience, and it has helped us, at least in terms of uh, um, making impact. But also what we have learned is that we had to invest heavily in education and also in the health sector. And this kind of investment is narrowing the gap. We have narrowed the gap in primary school. Now there are more girls than boys. And the number is increasing in secondary school and also in tertiary uh, institutions. In the health sector, the indicators have been very encouraging. We have seen the vaccination coverage over 90%. We have seen the women delivering in health facilities, of course, increasing above 90% as well. And we have seen the mortality reducing from 2000 to 2014. It has really reduced by 80%. And uh, the infant mortality have also reduced by 70%. So we are, in other words, we are getting the results. Uh, that is really very much encouraging for us. And because we are getting results everywhere in the financial sector, in the governance, in the social sector, this is giving us courage that really we need to do even more to make sure that we can close the gap. That's how we can sustain the economic development. But I think one thing that has not really, that we need to improve, and all of us together, one is learning from each other the work that we are doing here. If the IMF can do this every two years, I think this would be wonderful. At least they managed to bring all the stakeholders together. <laughs> then number two, seriously, we need data. We need statistics. We need to set indicators. We need to set standards. To make sure that we know where we are going. It's not just the numbers. It's not just the improvement. But you have to understand where are still the gaps. That means once we have the data and we have set ourselves standards, and we know that some countries are doing better in certain indicators. Then we can learn from each other and keep improving. And we need someone to connect us, I think the IMF, which is very good by the way on statistics, which is very good on capacity for statistics. I don't think they have any choice other than continue to lead us in this process so that we can get the right data that is going to inform the policymakers to take decisions. So I think this is the work that we have to take seriously. And this is what can help us to make progress and measure how far we've gone in terms of making progress. But I think what you have done here in the last three days is really commendable because this is really helping us to understand how we move forward, how we learn from each other, if we can maintain this momentum and understand that what we are doing is really contributing to our economic growth, inclusive development, and this is contributing to sustaining our growth which we have been working on. It's not that just the numbers but also the participation of everyone without leaving anybody behind. And it is interesting that this time it is being led by the International Monetary Fund, working together with others. I'm sure once they lead, everybody follows and everyone listens. So for us in Rwanda, we are already partners. And the people who have been here, I think also, I'm sure from what we have learned from each other, uh, we can see that this is really wonderful work that we commend that has been taking place here in Rwanda. I just didn't want to take much of the time, the speeches, because in diplomacy, we no longer like long speeches. It happened once when a diplomat made a speech for three hours. And of course, when he ended his speech, only one person was left. He turned around and said, why are you still here? He said, because I'm the next speaker. So well, thank you so much. <laughs>